Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Trino here. Today I'm looking at a video that was sent to me by Ewan through my website. It's from a channel called Finding Truth. Well, that's fine, I would prefer to believe true things over false ones, so let's seek some truth. Does evolution provide a valid explanation for the existence of multicellular life? It sure does. Now, of course, this happened so long ago that we aren't likely to ever find out for sure exactly how it happened, but there are a few different hypotheses to explain how it definitely could have happened. So, for starters, the development of multicellularity as a stably heritable trait has been demonstrated to be rather easy. In just one year, single-celled algae developed multicellularity as a defense mechanism against a filter-feeding amoeba. They had five colonies of algae, and two of them went multicellular, each in a different way, and each was stably heritable and remained so for at least four years after the initial experiment, even when removed from the presence of the amoeba, thereby removing the selection pressure. And the stably heritable bit is important. You see, unicellular life had a 1-2 to two billion year head start on multicellular life, so it had already adapted to the different environments found on Earth. Which means that, while multicellularity might provide an advantage sometimes, it wouldn't necessarily provide an advantage all the time. If a single mutation led to multicellularity, then that multicellular organism is now one single mutation away from becoming unicellular again, and the closely related unicellular organisms would already be well adapted for that environment. So what is needed is some sort of ratcheting mechanism, a mutation that provides a distinct advantage for the newly multicellular organism that would not be possible as a unicellular organism. So for instance, if the group of cells develop the ability to divide labor, having other cells do some of the work for them, in return for them doing some different work for the other cells. For instance, one group could grow an important molecule, while another can grow a different essential compound. Then that specialization gives them a distinct advantage over their unicellular cousins, meaning that the selection pressures will stop them from returning to unicellular life. At the end of the day, the more research that is being done in the matter, the easier it looks like the transition to multicellularity was. It only happened once each for plants and animals, but fungi appear to have developed multicellularity independently about a dozen times, and algae seems to have developed it at least three times, and in addition to the algae experiment that showed the evolution of multicellularity in a single year, there have been other similar experiments. One with a single-celled strain of yeast had multicellular clusters develop in less than two months, which again was stably heritable for more than 3,000 generations after that, and eventually led to the development of a new mode of reproduction where some of the cells would go through apoptosis, essentially killing themselves to allow the rest of the group to reproduce, which is a rudimentary version of cell differentiation, where the different cells develop different jobs. So at the end of the day, we have seen the development of multicellularity several times in lab settings, and we know of at least 25 times when it developed independently in the wild, and many of the genes that are important for multicellular development have their precursors in their unicellular cousins. Good day everyone. In previous episodes we explained that one of the most important features of theories are their ability to make predictions. Agreed. If a theory doesn't make predictions, then there's no way to test the validity of the theory. A theory that makes useful prediction is a useful theory. But a theory that makes predictions that then turn out to be false, meaning that when you test those predictions in reality, you find that the predictions are in contradiction with reality. When the predictions are false, and the theory, by consequence, is false. Eh, yeah, kind of? I mean... If it's something with enough evidence backing it up to actually become a scientific theory, then one failed prediction would just mean that a certain aspect of the theory is wrong. But if you're using theory in the colloquial sense to mean hypothesis, then yes, a false prediction means your hypothesis is incorrect. The human body has 30 to 40 trillion cells. There are so many millions of multicellular organisms on this planet. Yeah, so far so good. So what is the explanation offered by the theory of evolution by natural selection? 
I already went through it in more detail than I originally intended, but suffice it to say that we do have explanations for the development of multicellularity. The theory claims that starting from the very first cell, which was obviously a single cell organism, until the human being, there has been a very gradual, a very slow change. Bingo, got it. Life has been around for about 3 billion years. The estimates for when multicellular life first showed up vary, but are generally 1 to 2 billion years after the appearance of single-celled life. Considering the category of organisms known as animals have been around for only about 750 million years, that means that the development from the first single-celled organism to the first animal took about 2.25 billion years. That's pretty damn slow and gradual. And through natural selection, the mutations that are more fit to survive are selected. And that's actually why animals diversified relatively quickly once they showed up. With more cells as a part of the organism, there are now more opportunities for adaptation to both fill and create new ecological niches. So you have this organism, a more complex organism that has an advantage versus its competitive variance. So this one survives, and then another layer, and then another layer, and then another layer. It's a bit overly simplistic and slightly flawed, but it's a passable explanation. I would suggest changing the part about an organism with the advantage surviving slightly so that it doesn't imply that the organisms without the advantage do not survive. So maybe the one with the advantage has greater reproductive success. Because the ones without the advantage don't immediately die off, they just don't reproduce quite as much. Aside from that, though, decent explanation. Now... If we have this very complex creation, like the human being, a monkey, a lion, or a cat, or a mango tree, or an apple tree, and we have the starting point from a single cell. Well, the single-celled organisms that are around today are not necessarily the starting point for the multicellular organisms that are around today. Multicellularity evolved at least a billion years ago. The single-celled organisms that seeded the initial rise of multicellular organisms have likely gone extinct by now. Not necessarily, it's possible that some are still around, but it's not very likely. A necessary prediction is that we will have not only a single-celled organism, and then an organism with millions and billions and trillions of cells, but we will also have an organism that is made of two cells. Not necessarily. The experiment with the algae showed that the first ones to develop multicellularity preferred to exist in clusters of eight cells, so the jump to multicellularity did not have to go through a stage where it existed as a two-celled organism as an adult. That being said, bicellular organisms are not impossible. In fact, Diplococcus is a bacteria that, while technically a single-celled organism, usually occurs in pairs of joined cells. So there's that, kinda. Not two cells sitting together, or 1,000 cells sitting together in a colony, each one of them is an independent creature. No. A two-celled organism. Which actually brings up an interesting point. How do you tell if a group of cells is an organism or a colony of individuals? The main distinction is cell differentiation. In a truly multicellular organism, we expect to see different cells doing different specialized jobs. And there's also the reproduction method. For a single-celled organism, one cell reproducing is synonymous with the whole organism reproducing. But for a multicellular organism, individual cells within the organism may reproduce without the entire organism reproducing. But here again, we're talking about what we see today in complex multicellular and unicellular organisms. If we're extrapolating into the past, before life diversified quite as much as it has, we would expect to see simpler versions of this. For instance, the yeast experiment that I mentioned earlier. It developed a rudimentary form of cell differentiation, with specific cells slated to undergo apoptosis in order to allow for reproduction. That's not a great example of differentiation, because it's not very well developed, but that's why it actually is a great example of how cell differentiation could have begun. It started out with a fairly minor change, like the one observed in the yeast, and gradually specialized further over time. 
In the algae, I'm not aware of any cell differentiation that happened for them, but among the multicellular populations, they observed four new distinct life cycles that developed, some of which did still have a unicellular stage, but is that really surprising? After all, humans still have a unicellular stage, and we are undoubtedly multicellular. The algae in that experiment were said to have evolved simple multicellularity. All of the cells within the multicellular strains were contained within an extracellular matrix, or ECM, indicating that they had grouped together through cell division within the ECM rather than through colonial behavior of gathering together after reproduction. And all of the cells within the ECM are genetically identical, and function as a single unit as far as selection pressures are concerned. What it all comes down to is that the line between single-celled organisms behaving as a colony and multicellular organisms might seem obvious on the macro scale, but on the small scale it can be fuzzy at times. Which, if you think about it, is exactly what would be expected if this is all the result of a very gradual evolutionary process. And then, three-celled organisms. No, not really. With how cell division works, if we're expecting multicellular organisms to exist at every level of development, it would be a four-celled organism next. I mean, it certainly is possible for a three-celled organism to exist, but I wouldn't expect it to, and I don't know of any. And then four-celled organisms. Four-celled would be the logical progression from a two-celled organism, yes. Also, there is a species of multicellular algae that only has four cells. And each of these cells is an integral and an essential part of the organism. This cell is doing this function and this other cell is doing this other function. So you want to see advanced cellular differentiation in an organism that is supposed to represent the most basal multicellularity? That seems more than a bit unreasonable. Cellular differentiation would also have evolved gradually. You seem to have a grasp of the gradual nature of evolution when it comes to developing multicellularity as a trait, but why would we suddenly expect fully functional differentiations to show up immediately? They would also be gradual. And then, as more evolution takes place, cells get more specialized, they magically arrange themselves into organs? There is nothing magical about it. Organs usually evolve through a process in which an organism will develop a new functional potential in one of its tissues, combined with the development of a novel structure. These two processes do not necessarily have to happen in tandem, though they certainly could. New functional potential is when a mutation gives rise to, if not an actual new function, at least the potential for a new function. So, for instance, in the E. coli long-term evolution experiment, one culture of E. coli developed the ability to metabolize citrate aerobically after 31,000 generations. When the phylogenetic history of the citrate metabolizing E. coli was traced, it was found that a precursor mutation occurred around generation 15,000, without which the final mutation that allowed them to metabolize the citrate would not have been possible. The first mutation had no apparent effect on fitness, and so took some time to fix itself in the population, but once it was there, the jump to utilizing the new food source became rather trivial. Now, of course, we're talking about a single-celled organism with E. coli, so they're not about to develop new organs, but I'm just using them to illustrate a point. A mutation that seems to do nothing can be the precursor to a mutation that seems to cause a large evolutionary jump out of nowhere, and that's the kind of mutation that I'm referring to as having new functional potential. It starts the process of developing a new function. It likely won't be some drastic change that starts a brand new, fully developed function from scratch. And as far as novel structures go, these seem to be rather easy to develop through mutations in the Hox genes and their regulators. Hox genes control the body plan, and to give an example of just how easily they can mess with the body plan, picture a simple programming loop. So here's a basic loop in C, which makes more sense than writing a C loop in basic. I promise there are three people laughing at that right now. For those not programming savvy, I'll explain what this all means. We start out by declaring the variables. In this case, we have a variable that will store an integer, named num, with the starting value of zero. The loop is everything in between the squiggly brackets, with the while statement telling the program the conditions in which it should continue the loop. So in this case, as long as the integer stored in the num variable is less than five, it will repeat the loop. In the loop, we have the program calling a function, which I just made up, and we're just going to have to pretend that this function is responsible for building a body segment. So every time the program runs through the loop, it builds a body segment. So let's say that's a vertebrae on a snake. 
the num++ at the end just adds 1 to the integer being stored in num. So the first time through the loop, the 0 becomes a 1. What this little bit of code will do is run through the build.segment function five times before moving on to the next section of code. Now, if we simply take that five in the conditions of the loop and change it to a six, we have it running through the loop six times instead of five and building six segments. So with one single point mutation, we've added a whole other segment complete with bone, blood vessels, nerves, muscle tissue, and everything else. It's an imperfect analogy as DNA doesn't really behave like computer code, but it serves the purpose of allowing us to picture how a small change to the underlying code can result in a big change in an organism. You just need to change the part where the Hox genes tell the embryo how many of a certain segment to build, or where to put the legs, or where the wings go, or how many wings go there, or any number of other instructions for which a minor change can result in a large phenotypic change. Sometimes changes like this will work well with one of the potential function changes, creating a structure in which the function now has an opportunity to work. And boom, you have the makings of a new organ. And each organ will do a specific function. They magically communicate the product of each organ and gives it to the other organs so that the whole organism survives and so forth and so forth. Again, it's not magic, it's chemistry. Enzymes, hormones, and neurotransmitters. Early life would have been able to do without, but as soon as basic communication between organs evolved, that organism would have had a substantial advantage over others, allowing it to lead a healthier and longer life, with less risk of organ failure because a different organ released too much of whatever compound it was making without the rest of the body being able to tell it to stop. Will he manage to connect the dots between how gradually multicellularity would have evolved and how gradually everything else would have evolved as well? Or will he continue to insist that fully functioning complex systems showed up instantaneously? To find out, tune in tomorrow, same Rhino time, same Rhino channel.